Okay, this ought to be pretty easy and fast to go through, okay? Elegos means evidence, okay? U means not, it's, it's a Greek particle of negation of a fact. Lepomenon, again, it's a plural genitive. So not seeings would be the literal Greek, okay? It's not good English. So it would be evidence, not seeings, plural. Okay, now notice he's doing parallelism here. You got tic tac toe. Your first clause, if you were to write this down on the pay on a blank piece of paper, you'd write pistis and pisomenum. That would be your first. Think of tic tac toe. Exactly below it, you'd write the next two words, hypostasis pragmaton. You'll notice that hypostasis would be under pistis. See, you got pistis, nominative singular, here right underneath it and parallel to it in apposition is hypostasis, nicknamed for Christ. Alright? Then your third, you know, exactly under hypostasis would be elegos, evidence. Now notice the tic-tac-toe, okay? And this was done an awful lot in ancient Greek and every other ancient language I know anything about, they like to play word games. And we, we do this even to some lesser extent in English now. You have a vertical line. Pistis is the first word in you know on a blank sheet of paper. Exactly below it would be hypostasis. And then exactly below that would be elegos. Alright? Pistis, if you want to Word of God, all right? That's the contract that we're to believe in. That's the thing that evokes our trust and faith, all right? Word of God. In parallel and opposition, therefore further describing Word of God, is hypostasis, and who is that? Christ himself, all right? And then third, evidence. Now what the ancients did a lot of Sorry. What the ancients did a lot of is they liked to play the kind of game where if you if you had something running vertically, it gave a little message. All right? You had words that you printed or more often carved horizontally and vertically, and you aligned the words or the letters so that they would have more meaning because of the alignment. So think of Word of God on a sheet of paper, and directly below that, Christ. And directly below that, evidence. See? Word, Christ, evidence. Running vertically on a sheet of paper. You with me on that? And then you have epizomenon, and a quick way of... Um, Rendering that in English would be believed, just right believed or confidently believed, all right? Write that next to, you have Word of God on a sheet of paper, right next to it, horizontally, confidently believed. Underneath Word of God, you've probably written by now, Christ. So that Word of God is on the top line, Christ is in the middle, exactly underneath Word of God, so you see the association vertically. And then directly beneath, conf confidently believed, to the right of Word of God, you're going to write down trial matters. It's not going to be smooth English, but it, it, I'll explain why in a minute, why we're doing it this way. Trial matters. And then directly below Christ, you're going to write evidence. And then directly below trial matters in the second line, that's to the right of Christ, you're going to you're going to write down unseen. Okay, so now look. Confident believings, confidently believed. Trial matters, 
because this is a more proper way to translate this. Trial matters unseen. See, that's the you you got two columns. In the left hand column, you have you have word of God, and just directly below that you have Christ, which obviously we know is true, and then just below that evidence. So word of God, Christ, evidence. Now you can see the dual entendre right there in that first vertical column. The word of God is the Bible. The word of God is also Christ who came in the flesh and dwelt among us. And therefore the third part of that vertical column, elekos, evidence. The evidence of God is the word of God, which is in two forms. The written word that we got that we can touch, taste, and feel, and the existence of the person who became the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And although every single idea in human history of any topic is disputed by everybody every which way, for those who are hung up on consensus, there is a general consensus that Jesus the Christ really existed in really died in 30 AD okay there's just too much information about the Christians prior to 60 AD to deny that just too much okay I mean Nero wouldn't have blamed the Christians when he you know supposedly you know when Rome burned whether it was his fault or not Nero wouldn't have blamed the Christians if there was no Christ Caligula wouldn't have wanted to go to the temple in the 40s AD if there was no Christ. That was the big attraction for Caligula to go. Okay, Claudius would not have thrown out the Jews and Christians in an attempt to go back to Rome's religion if there was no Christ. See, it was a big deal in Rome. It was novel, so they bought into it for that reason. And there were a lot of people who converted, so they bought into it for that reason. And there are many other ways I could prove to you that you know Christ really existed. But see, Word of God is Christ. That's the second line, first column on your sheet of paper. And therefore, evidence. You see how that first left column reads Word of God, then below that Christ, and then below that evidence, there's a very famous kind of structuring of words and clauses that the Greeks use, I've seen the Chinese use it also. Okay? And then your second column is a bizomenon, confidently believed, and then just below that would be pragmatum, the trials, which I have to say more about in a minute, and then just below that, unseen. So what do you have? Confident believings, literal Greek. Trials, and then just below trials, unseen. Confident believings, trials, unseen. You see the message there. You're confidently believing. Now it's talking about your faith. But that the word that's talking about your faith is this word here not this word. This word is the content of what you're believing, the word of God. It's the word of God that is Christ and evidence. That's why I asked you to write this on a sheet of paper. It's the word of God that is Christ and evidence. Now you're believing in it is on trial and is unseen. So the trial of your belief is real, everybody knows that anyhow, and is unseen because it's in your head. The evidence, however, is not your believing. See, this is so totally wrong. It's the opposite of what the verse says. Faith is not the substance of things hoped for. No, the word of God, confidently believed, 
is Christ on trial and that is unseen evidence. It's the trial that's unseen. The trial between God and the angels is unseen. That's the part that's unseen. The word of God is very much seen. You're seeing it right now on screen. Christ was very much seen. There's a whole lot of evidence he was really here. So that's visible. Okay? So that's not what this is referring to. Unseen evidence is what's going on in your head. You don't even know. Because what's on trial is epizomenon. You're believing in it. That's what's on trial. That's what Hebrews 11 is about, even in the English. Now, I need to say a couple more closing remarks. I spent a lot of time in the first increment talking about how apizomenon is objective genitive. This is a genitive plural. Objective genitive. We know it's objective genitive, not subjective genitive. Because pistis is the object of the believings. It's the subject of the sentence, and in Greek you have to pick one case or another. You can't pick two at the same time. So in order to stress how it's the object of the believings, pistis is put first. Okay? It's put first. Because you're supposed to put the word first, you get the pun. All right? But it's the object of your believings. So this is an objective genitive. You're only allowed to pick one. When you're parsing a passage or delineating a passage or deciding the interpretation of a passage, when it comes to subjective, objective, or plenary genitive, you have to pick one. Now here's what I would submit to you. Pick one, each one, individually. Pistis is in the nominative case, right? It's the subject of our believings, isn't it? It's the reason why we believe, isn't it? You read the Bible, and because you read the Bible, that's what it, why you believe. Because the Bible itself is evidence. See, that's the third, third word in the first column on your sheet of paper. The Bible is evidence. Visible evidence. It's not unseen. It's visible. Okay, therefore the subject is, as it were, evoking trust and faith, and therefore you believe. It's the subject of your belief. It's what evokes your belief. See how clever that is? So you could call that subjective genitive, except technically speaking, pistis is not, does, you know, pistis doesn't do anything. Unless you want to get to Hebrews 4.12, which says that the word of God is alive and powerful. Then you could play that game with it, and it would be perfectly okay. You see the point? Subjective genitive. You could play with this and say, well, ooh, that's a subjective genitive right here. Because the word of God is alive and powerful, namely this guy, Christ, who posts us, which is right next in the sentence. And he's also what? In usual Greek? You list the object after the verb. This is actually a participle because it's dramatic Greek. Okay, well, he's listed afterwards. Isn't he the object of your faith? Isn't this clever? See how the writer with economy of style, using three sevens, three seven-syllable clauses, is saying so much more than this pitiful translation here. Just fire the whole all the English Bibles. Just fire them all. Alright? Your confident believings are based on the Word of God, who is the Word of God, who is also the object of your believing. Word of God content, Bible. Word of God in the flesh, Christ. Hypostasis. The exact representation of God. The exact nature of God. Co-equal with the Father. Got that? Isn't that cute? All right, now I have to cover more on pragmaton. Pragmaton is a noun. It is not a participle. But it is what's called a verbal noun. It denotes a verbal action, a case at law. 
a case at law is a process. Therefore, even though it's a noun and not a participle, it has verbal force. Okay? So, the person who is the subject and object of the trials, the cases at law, the trials at the bar, is who? Jesus Christ. See how cute that is? So, this is an objective genitive too, in the fact that the object of the trial, the person that, you know, is on trial, the defendant, is Jesus Christ. But he's also the subject of the trial, the cause of the trials. So you could translate this as a subjective genitive, as well as an objective genitive. See how cool this is. I mean, see, this is how you know the Bible is the Word of God. It's so clever. This is why I'm so in love with it. All right? Our third clause, this one's real straightforward. Elevos, evidence. Okay? And here we're looking at the legal meaning. Evidence, evidence in a trial. Evidence you present in a trial to prove your point. Okay, but now what verb, what participle goes with it? Ooh from ook, particle denying the fact of a thing, blepomeno. We can't see how our faith is on trial. We can't see the fact that there is a trial. And this is also in the genitive plural. And things don't see, people see. Things don't go on trial, people do. See, apostasies can't refer to things at all. Things aren't on trial. Christ is on trial. And it's trials plural, which means we as body of Christ. See, over here, remember the last reference? Upostaseus. We are metokoi. We are partakers in Christ. So that's why this is a genitive plural. We're on trial because we're body of Christ. Because we're partakers of Christ. He's on trial, so we're on trial. And the evidence is us but it's not seen because why because a believings is inside your head your confident expectation is inside your head you express it with your mouth but nobody can really see what you're believing i could say i believe that the moon is made of green cheese and if i act it out you know genuinely enough you'll think i actually believe it but i don't so it's unseen what I really believe. And seeings are done by people, think, not things. There are no things in this verse anywhere. So just fire whoever came up with this as a translation. Fire them. They don't even deserve to have a job. And I'm sorry I'm being so sharp, but we're talking about how Jesus Christ is cut out of this verse. And if you look on the left-hand side in blue, there's no reason to cut him out. You saw him in Hebrews 1.3, he's bookended again in Hebrews 3.14 on the left-hand side of the screen, and this is the third entry using him, calling him the hypostasis. Plus, this is one of the most famous terms in theology for Jesus Christ. How can we be so damn dumb? Oh, we're not seeing. Yeah, we're not seeing the meaning of the verse. So, now we get to evidence. That's also in the nominative case, left-hand column, on your sheet of paper, unseen. Okay, evidence unseen. When you see something, there is an object of what you see. So again, you can call this objective genitive. Okay, but at the same time, evidence is the subject of seeing or not seeing. So you could call this a subjective genitive. It's evidence, all right, but nobody sees it. You cannot tell an atheist why you believe in Christ. No matter what you say or no matter what evidence you have, he won't see it. That's not to fault the atheist. The evidence of your faith is inside your head. It's the way God added up the data 
of your life to you. And at some point, your brain opened up, your eyes opened up, and you saw him in your head. Now, who's going to believe you that you did that? Okay? It's, I could tell you 16,000 things that God does to me every single day. But you've only got my word for it. You can't see my life. You can't see inside my head. You don't know what he's doing to it. So it's just one witness as far as you're concerned. So do you see the evidence? No. See how clever this is? So the evidence is both subject and object. But you have to do it in Greek, proper Greek. You have to do it one at a time. So you call the evidence is the object of not seeing. You're not seeing the evidence. You can talk all day to an atheist. He will not see the evidence that you see. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to badmouth atheism when I say that. It's not seeable. This is what the verse is telling you. The evidence is not seen. It's in your head. And the atheist rightly says, well, how do you know you're not hallucinating? And there's no way to explain it to him until he himself gets the evidence himself inside his own head himself from God himself. It's going to be unseen as far as he's concerned. And then after he has the evidence, nobody's going to believe him because they can't see it. That's the whole point of Hebrews 11, is that the evidence is there, it's real, you see it, but nobody else does, and then on top of that, we don't see what kind of trial witness us, who postasis pragmaton, look at the left-hand side of the screen when you see that, the, the Christ on trial, Christ thinking on trial, because we're partakers of him. Therefore, this is genitive plural. Now, I know this was all sophisticated. I'm sorry I had to do it again. If I still don't make sense, yell at me in the comments.